Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Begin with a Pauline greeting there, uh, because I feel like the Apostle Paul, who wrote letters to churches when he couldn't be there uh, in person with them. But now here, thanks to the uh, wonders of modern technology, you get a video message and you can see my face. So, <laughs> grateful for that. A uh, reminder to stay home when you're sick, right? And so I'm glad we can still be here together. So I went to court once to fight a traffic ticket that I thought was a, a, a bit unreasonable. As there wasn't any other car involved, there was no damaged property, I wasn't speeding, the road was icy, and I had to brake in order to merge because there was no space, and I slid off. And so I didn't think um, the ticket was necessary. <laughs> and growing up, I had heard that uh, a rumor that traffic tickets, minor traffic tickets, were pretty easy to contest because no one put in a lot of uh, resources trying to prosecute them. So you could show up, have a respectful conversation, and get it dismissed. And as a, I was a student at the time with limited uh, income, so I thought I would give it a try at least. As it turns out, the word on the street was wrong. <laughs> and I showed up at my appointed uh, court time, and so did the officer who issued the ticket, and so there was also um, a prosecuting attorney there. I think that's the right term. I'm not big on my court terms. But uh, nonetheless, I did have an opportunity to state my case, and then um, I was asked a bunch of questions. It felt rapid fire. I don't remember too much of the details, except for my stress level, which just kept rising. And then at the end, she kept repeating the question, because uh, I wasn't answering it directly. Did you intend to drive into the ditch? Until finally I had no choice but to stammer out a no and hang my head in defeat. There was no way I was going to talk myself out of that. Nicodemus was reduced to a similar confusing stammer in his encounter with Jesus that we read about today. I think Nicodemus is a bit misunderstood. Uh, some people say he's embarrassed to be seen with Jesus, so he comes to meet him while it's dark. Others accuse Nicodemus as coming to question Jesus in a sort of accusatory manner. Uh, but I don't really see either of those in the text. He doesn't even ask Jesus a question to begin. And then all of a sudden, Jesus just unleashes a whole slew of thoughts that are about things that Nicodemus hasn't brought up and, and a bunch of things that don't make a lot of sense to me and judging by Nicodemus's response, I don't think they make a lot of sense to him either. Now I'll admit I don't really like how Jesus responds to Nicodemus coming to him. Not really letting the man talk, using these confusing metaphors that leave one's head spinning. It reminded me of that day in court. And that doesn't feel like a loving God, a loving relational God to me. I'm guessing Nicodemus wants something else out of this encounter with Jesus other than what he gets. If Nicodemus wanted to talk, well, it's not particularly working because he's reduced to his final question, uh, how can this be? Until then he fades into the background and doesn't say anything else as Jesus' monologue continues. But Jesus' question, how can this be? About, or Nicodemus' question about how can this be to Jesus' talk about being born from above is a question that we continue with. Uh, it has stuck throughout the ages, and Christians still debate endlessly about what it means to be born again versus born from above. What does it entail? When does that happen? Am I doing it right? Uh, is it a big dramatic thing and, and then it's permanent or is it subtle and piecemeal with small steps forward and then some small steps back? Uh, oh, you have to use this prayer, you have to do this thing. There's a whole lot of cultural baggage attached to this, to this one. And we can and we probably will continue to spend time and energy trying to make sense of Jesus' words here in John chapter 3 for more ages to come. But I can't help but wonder if maybe making sense of them is not quite the point. Maybe Jesus' words are doing the very thing they are describing. They are bringing forth new life. For Nicodemus, that new life looks, the beginning of that new life looks like confusion 
and uncertainty and a loss for words. As you see, Nicodemus is a Pharisee. And Pharisees know things. They know the law. They know the prophets. They know the Hebrew scriptures. They know the traditions in the temple. They know all sorts of things. Knowing things is how they make sense of the world and their role in it. Knowing things is how they make sense of God. And knowing is what Nicodemus is after here. Sure, he could be embarrassed to, to be seen with Jesus, or he could be sent to scout out whether or not he's a threat to the Pharisees, or he could just be curious. He could just want to know. He's an intellectual guy. He's seen some of what Jesus has done in his public ministry so far, and he wants to know more. And then Jesus reduces him to a stammering, confused man of few words. And so begins the process of a rebirth. It does not come from the knowing. Nicodemus's intellect has its limits. It is not what will save him. And our intellect, our knowing, our being right is not what saves us either. Being born from above, this restart, this new life, it doesn't come from anything Nicodemus does at all. It comes from his encounter with Jesus. So how has Nicodemus changed? What does this look like in his life? We don't know too many details of his life, but he does show up in John's Gospel two more times. And interestingly, both times, he is defined by this encounter with Christ. He's introduced as Nicodemus, who, has, who had gone to Jesus earlier, and Nicodemus, who went to Jesus at night. So that meeting, that first meeting somehow, even in some small way, changed Nicodemus. And the final time we meet Nicodemus, he has come to help bury Jesus' body. So yes, I would say this encounter changed him in some way. Encounters with God do not leave us in the same state as when we started. Pastor Joanna Harader offers some good questions for reflection on Nicodemus in relation to our own varied faith journeys, and I want to commend them to you. She writes, I know that some people do have those radical conversion stories, and there are also a lot of us Nicodemuses, those of us who are curious, who want to ask questions. There are some of us who, after years of knowing Jesus, still aren't sure exactly what we think about him. We don't know exactly what we believe, and yet he has changed our lives. Slowly, somehow, we are more and more defined by our encounters with him, more and more motivated by our love for him. And this, too, is a path of discipleship worth walking, a story worth telling. And this path gives us new questions to ask each other, not simplistic yes or no questions like, have you been born again, but interesting, lovely questions like, where have you met Jesus? What do you think of him so far? How is your life different because of him? So I commend those questions to you. Where have you met Jesus? What do you think of him? How is your life different? We are changed by our encounters with God. We are reborn over and over again each and every day, not by our own doing, not by our own ability to reason or debate or know the right things, not even by doing enough good deeds, but by the transformative love of God as unpredictable, uncontainable, and powerful as the wind but steadfast and true. God's love is lifted up on the cross for me and for you and for this whole world that God loves so, so much. Thanks be to God. Amen.